I'm Caleb Benjamin, intern at Lawfare, with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for November 11th, 2023. This week on the Lawfare Podcast, Benjamin Wittes spoke with Molly Reynolds about the numerous national security issues on new Speaker of the House Mike Johnson's plate, including aid for Israel and Ukraine, assistance for Taiwan, the border, and more. For today's Archive episode, I picked an episode from March 2nd, 2019, in which Margaret Taylor sat down with Luke Murray, National Security Advisor to then-Republican House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, and Daniel Silverberg, National Security Advisor to then-Democratic House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer, to discuss the national security issues facing Congress at the time and how congressional staff members work across the aisle to formulate security policy. I'm Margaret Taylor, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, March 2nd, 2019. It's hard to open a newspaper or turn on the television without hearing about the dysfunction and partisan polarization affecting members of Congress. But what about their staffs? And what does that mean for national security? This week, I sat down with seemingly unlikely partners, Luke Murray, National Security Advisor to Republican House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, and Daniel Silverberg, National Security Advisor to Democratic House Majority Leader Steny Hoyer. The three of us spoke about security issues facing this Congress, what staffers do on a day-to-day basis, and how the two of them actually work together. It's the Lawfare Podcast, Episode 396, Luke Murray and Daniel Silverberg on National Security in Congress. So before we get to the meat of what I I really invited the two of you on to talk about, I want to just you know, briefly talk about there has been news reporting recently that the president directed uh, that Jared Kushner get uh, a security clearance. And I kind of want to just get your take on that. Um, From my perspective, it does seem sort of highly unusual, highly problematic. And so my question is, what do you think and and what what can we expect from Congress in terms of oversight um, on that press reporting? Daniel, do you want to take that one? Sure. Well, what I really want to do is kick it to Luke <laughs> in the studio right now, watch him squirm. But uh, I, I think from an institutional perspective, it's obviously quite disconcerting. And I think the relevant chairman have already made pretty clear that they're going to look into the issue. I think the challenge and opportunity for Democrats generally here is to maintain focus and discipline and to be true to our overall goals here of not necessarily trying to go after the president per se or to be directly political here, but to be very clear on our objectives of preserving and strengthening fundamental democratic institutions. So this type of oversight, I think, is not going to be so much about trying to shine a light or directly assail the president or his family. I think it's a question of fundamental preservation of a democratic process, which is making sure nepotism isn't influencing these really core decisions, which for us sitting at this table or anyone who's had to fill out an SF-86 or go through a polygraph, we feel particularly sensitive about. Luke, what, what do you think? (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. I was really trying to punt on that one. Uh, no, I look, I, I think I've got two fundamental questions in my mind on this issue. One is, what were the reasons for which he was not recommended to get a security clearance? I don't think that that's completely clear yet. And two, what are the metrics which um, we usually use in order to determine whether someone is cleared for a security clearance? I think that should be pretty simple. I know those metrics are out there. I just, I'm not in that world, so I'm reluctant to comment on them. You're both really very experienced Capitol Hill staffers um, and have been working, you know, in a highly politicized, uh, politically charged environment um, for years together. Can you just give me give me your view uh, based on your experience of sort of how you see the next two years, 116th Congress sort of unfolding on national security um, and foreign policy issues in general? You know, what can we really expect to see in this sort of oversight space over the next two years? I think my mind goes right to the must-pass things, right? Like, let's use that as lowest common denominator. One which may be must-pass, may actually not be must-pass, Section 215 of USA Freedom Act, where you have this bulk collection of basically metadata on telephone conversations, not the actual content of the conversations, but we're talking about length of call, time of call, who's calling. 
and that expires uh, at the end of this year. But the administration actually hasn't been using it for the past six months because of problems with the way in which that information was collected and possibly collecting on U.S. citizens uh, in the way that was transferred from private companies to the administration after they got FISA court approval. So if the administration does ask on that, that's that's inherently a very sensitive subject. And we, we've seen that sensitivity be true in other areas of USA Freedom Act. And so that, I think, is going to be a real challenge for Congress. But I'm not actually certain that the administration want to start that back up, given where they've been in the last six months. And just a quick plug here, Lawfare actually has some great articles breaking this down on knowing, understanding more of the nuances of this section and, and why it's critical to national security and why there are some uh, fundamental questions behind how it's used. Yes, very very much so. I I think 215 is going to be a major issue. I I think there will be a few specific vehicles that are going to provide us an opportunity to have major national security oversight and debates. Obviously, the NDAA and the Intel authorization are going to be big ones. I think big picture, there's a perception among some circles that Democrats are looking just to go political in the national security space. And I don't think that's the case. I think that when I look at overall objectives, the first is holding the administration accountable the way I would hope any Congress would do so. And that means looking at where agencies are falling short. Obviously, there is a political element here of where there have been conflicts of interest, certainly concerns about politicization of the State Department, looking at potential foreign influence and corruption in the government. I think second, there's a major focus on trying to secure United States democracy and those of our allies. That means looking at external threats, of course, Russian disinformation, Chinese threats, cyber, and internal threats. And last, I would say there's going to be an increased focus on human rights and democracy. I think it's fair to say there's a perception that this administration has been less aggressive on these issues. And I think where the administration plays good cop, then Congress and particularly Democrats feel the motivation to play bad cop. And you're already seeing that manifest itself in the Saudi context. I think members are on both sides of the aisle are expressing serious concern about the president's statements in Hanoi with regard to Otto Warmbier and that perception of kowtowing to dictators. I think there's going to be significant pushback on that. And then there are the big, the major items that are just extraordinarily difficult to deal with. Like, what are we going to do on China? How do we address climate change? Major security challenges that I'll be honest, we know we have to deal with and we are actively trying to identify a way forward. Just to talk, add on to what Daniel was saying, I think two quick points. One is Congress historically has always played the more bad cop role on human rights and where the administrations, you know, across different parties, different presidents have at most of the time downplayed that compared to where Congress is. And so to me, that's not new, but it's it's new in a different way in terms of this administration and this Congress. And it's interesting to see the manifestations now. And I think Absolutely. There's a lot of momentum behind human rights issues in, in Congress now on, on both sides of the aisle. Second thing just to flag is we are in an incredibly hyper-partisan atmosphere right now, which means the things that we usually do, even in national security foreign policy areas, are also kind of threatened in terms of our ability to get those to become public law. You know, National Defense Authorization Act has passed 58 years in a row, and yet now we have one of the most politically toxic issues directly as part of the discussion of National Defense Authorization Act, and that's immigration and the wall, you know, using military funds to pay for the wall. That, that is very hard to find compromise on, as we've just seen in the latest government shutdown. And now you're going to have that debate again in National Defense Authorization Act. So I think there's concern in the national security community, at least people who are on the Hill on this, that um, we are in a, a different kind of atmosphere right now that threatens to do even the things which we've done well uh, in the midst of some challenging circumstances previously, this is this is a new ball game. Yeah, and I think the the opportunity for guys like Luke and me, I shouldn't use a gender specific 
uh, <laughs> character <laughs> description. Um, folks, folks. For, for folks, for staffers like, like Luke and me, and we, we, we've really been in the trenches together for a few years now on these issues, the opportunity here is there are, I think, a few discrete issues where members really do feel a sense of passion and latitude to work together. And I saw it in Munich two weeks ago, the fact that 53 members were there and the passion and excitement with which members were speaking about needing to reaffirm the NATO alliance, needing to reassure our core allies that there is a different foreign policy voice and apparatus in Congress. Now, how we translate that and manifest that practically, of course, that's going to be a challenge. And it's easy to have all the right rhetoric uh, that we see eye to eye in reassuring our partners. But hey, wait a second. Can we really support X bill together? You saw huge support for a bill prohibiting the withdrawal from NATO. I think that's a good start. Um, the next couple of tests are going to be, OK, how do we approach Yemen? Um, how do we approach some basic issues relating to government transparency and things like that. But our opportunity and challenge, pointing to Luke and me here, is building on the momentum on those few discrete issues where we do agree to get our members to work together on. And I think democracy and human rights actually is one of them. Agreed. Yeah. Great. Um, I will look forward to covering that on Lawfare uh, <laughs> for sure. Um, so, you know, in the vein of sort of peeling back the curtain a little bit on how Capitol Hill actually works, I'd love it if each of you, you know, sort of shared a little bit more about what you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. I ask because I think our lawfare listeners are very familiar and I think pretty sophisticated on so the executive branch functions in the national security space, but maybe less so on sort of the, the congressional role and in particular sort of staffer's role. So could you just sort of talk about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and also give us your view of sort of where you think your work fits into the sort of United States national security apparatus? Sure. Well, I'll start. I came over from the Pentagon. And no question, my head was spinning at first because working on a congressional committee is pretty different than being in the C ring in the general counsel's office. I, I think the biggest differences are, one, the proximity to a constitutional officer and the total lack of a bureaucracy, which obviously it, it has its positives and negatives, but if one came to Washington to make a difference and move policy, gosh, it is immediate and personally, it's it's highly gratifying. So on any one day, here are the three things that I think I'm doing. One is the really classic work that folks in the executive branch do as well. It's staffing a principal. And in our cases, it's pretty senior members of Congress, making sure that they understand what's happening around the world, what's happening in the foreign policy space on the Hill and around Washington, and making sure that they have what they need for meetings, for interactions with members, really traditional staff work. I think the second piece is the developing, the cajoling, and ultimately the execution of democratic foreign policy, coming up with the bills, the letters, the resolutions, because so much in foreign policy doesn't happen through legislation. You mean you mean big D democratic or small D? <laughs> uh, in this case, I'm thinking big D. Okay. So for our side of the aisle, for the Democratic Caucus, helping along with other members of leadership shape what we think foreign policy should be and what mechanisms we want to use to influence that. So Yemen and NATO and any number of question uh, issues. How are we going to advocate on these issues and where do we want our members to be? And then practically managing the legislation that's coming to the floor. Probably the top thing that in my job now, since I work for the majority leader and his purview is to control the floor, it's my job to uh, manage all the details of the bills that are, are coming to the floor. And I think the third piece is the coordinating oversight and coordinating what our committees are doing. A piece of that is making sure that, and this is something that didn't really exist in the executive branch, it's making sure that our newer members, both are 
educated and engaged on these issues, but also have opportunities for them to speak on issues they care about and to raise their profiles and to be engaged. So at any one moment, I'm doing all three of those. I don't know necessarily well, but Luke, you tell me if, because in some ways it's this challenge to describe what do we do on... And, and in some sense, you're, you're, you're sort of switching roles a little bit because switching from minority to, to majority. So Luke, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, Daniel summarized it pretty well. I, I think I'd add a few things to that. One is in terms of differences with the executive branch. When we act on foreign policy or national security, most of the time we are reactive. We are, it's, it's in response to an administration policy which Congress fundamentally disagrees with, or at least there's a majority of Congress that can get that done. So it's hard for us in terms of, and I think this gets to another difference, the political nature of Congress to be too forward thinking or too proactive. That's, uh, you know, that I would love if we could do that better. But I think we just have to be honest that when we're talking foreign policy and national security, much like we're talking about many other issues outside of those uh, areas, that we are a reactionary body. And, and that brings us to the second point is, is I think one, one other difference is we have to understand the political nature of these issues. And there is a political nature of these issues. We, we see differences between Republicans and Democrats. We see differences with, within the Republican conference and within the Democrat caucus in terms of different subgroups and what they support and what they don't support. And as a national security advisor, if I don't have an understanding of the political nature of this issue, I'm not going to serve my boss well and we're not going to be able to execute the vision that he has. The other issue is I think it's hard to get at you know, there's not one principle like the executive branch where it can keep getting put up to the top and then the decision comes down and everybody complies with that. Congress is a, is a much more diffuse body, if you will, right? And the ability for leaders, even in Congress, to control other members, it just doesn't work like that, right? Like members are responsible to their constituents. And this is kind of how the Constitution designed it. And they, at times, will be happy to buck leadership if it's important enough to them, whether in principle or whether it's important enough to their, to their constituents. And so you don't have that kind of unification of policy, and this is what we're going to do on, on every issue. And it's true on other issues. You, you can reach consensus. Everybody's good with it. But on some issues, look, these members think this way. We're probably not going to convince them, and they're going to vote that way, and there's nothing that we can do about that. And so you, you kind of have to hold it with an open hand in terms of you're not going to be able to execute everything the way that you want, even if your principal is totally on board with you. So yeah. can I can I just ask you guys, how, how often do your bosses and, you know, to the extent you know sort of generally about other members, how often do they hear from constituents on national security issues, vice you know, other sorts of domestic uh, concerns like health care. You know, is it is it just a small percentage? Is it a large percentage? How would you sort of characterize constituent interest uh, for members on national security issues? I had heard of a candidate who was running this last election, and she was communicating how she was out on the trail. And foreign policy was not the number one issue, not the number two issue, not the number three issue. She wasn't even sure it was in the top ten. However, I think there are some issues which resonate with enough constituents where you're going to see it really influence policy. So for on, on our side in particular, right, anything about Iran, immediately constituents are going to understand that and they're going to have an opinion on that. ISIS is very similar. China, interestingly, has become more and more so that way over particularly the last five years. So I think it breaks down on the issue in terms of how much it resonates with the constituency and how much it doesn't. And you have to be careful about that too, right? Understanding what issues is really going to have strong constituent input. And I think that's a good thing that constituents are engaging in foreign policy. I would love to see them engage even more because that gives our members the clearance that, yes, we have the support of the American people and we can vote in confidence for this. It's really hard actually on, on the issues where we're not hearing much from constituents and it's not really clear where the American people are, where you might have some you know, it's not super clear on what the right thing is to do. And not having that input from the American people, I think, makes it harder on the, on the decision maker. Yeah, very much so. And I, I think that a lot of our freshman members are now experiencing the sense of dissonance between the campaign trail where foreign policy does not come up. Russia wasn't coming up. We were pulling our hair out in D.C., both of us, trying to make it a priority and make people understand the threat. And it was not a major campaign issue, maybe Helsinki a little bit. But now that they've come to Washington, 
I think they feel a serious responsibility to engage on these issues and to, frankly, serve as a check on this administration. I, at risk of sounding righteous or preachy here, one of the biggest differences I see between the executive branch and where we work now is that politics is not seen as a bad thing. It is seen as a necessary thing. And there's a dismissiveness in the executive branch of, oh, well, they're so political on the Hill. I don't see a lot of the things we do as political. I see them as representative of fundamental ideological differences on foreign policy. You look at Iran, I will give the other side the benefit of the doubt. Sure, there is politi politicking on it, but there are also serious disagreements about how we should be approaching the situation in Iran. And this idea that somehow there is pure policy without a tinge of what do my constituents want or what are alternative ideas here, I think is problematic. And it's something that at any given moment on the Hill, we need to be thinking of this triangle of policy politics the media. So, yeah, I mean, just touching, you know, sort of riffing off of that, I mean, clearly they're going to be issues where, you know, either the two of you are going to disagree on a policy or your bosses are going to be disagreeing. How do you approach that? How do you deal with that with each other? You know, even in even in your personal interactions, like how do you sort of square the circle when I think you would certainly both agree that everyone's end goal is to, you know, protect, secure the nation, protect our national security and have an effective foreign policy. So so how do you do that? What does that look like when you're working together? Well, one thing I'm really appreciative of Daniel is when I first got the job, uh, maybe first week or two, he sat down with me and just gave me all sorts of advice on how to do the job well. And that really set the tone, I think, for our relationship and how we work together where we don't assume the worst, right? We're, we're assuming that the uh, that our counterpart is operating from good intentions they really do have the best interest of the United States in mind. Now, that might mean we're on completely opposite sides of the, of the policy. But I'm not doubting his motives, right? I'm not doubting his intentions. And then that allows me to actually negotiate with a trust level where if he can get somewhere with me, he will. And sometimes that's not possible. So I think Yemen is a great example. Um, we had a resolution that passed last Congress that was a compromise resolution. It was not a Yemen war powers bill. And that took a lot of work to get there. This Congress, it was clear that on the Democrat side, another resolution was not going to be good enough. And we really needed to see, they really needed to see war powers on the floor. And so I, I didn't fault Daniel for that and blame him for that. I didn't feel like that was playing politics. I, I understood that was the reality in which he was dealing with. And we just kind of agreed to disagree. And the other thing here too is kind of have a short memory, right? Like, we were on we were on opposite sides of that issues for for a number of reasons. That doesn't mean that we can't the next day pick up the phone, call each other, and figure out a solution on a different bill or a different issue. Sort of compartmentalization of mm -hmm. of issues. Yeah, that note for our listeners: there are two bottles of empty bourbon here <laughs> on the table. So whoever did the last Lawfare podcast had a good time. Um, and God, Luke, if you drank, it'd be so much easier. <laughs> but, uh, but sorry, man. Sorry, I, I Luke hit it on the head of no question we have differing perspectives and this sounds kind of hokey of obviously we we work for very different bosses and are doing our jobs in butting heads on any number of issues i think fundamentally i know i work really well when i respect the principles the character and the intentions of my counterpart and in Luke's case and in the case of his two predecessors, I very much felt that was the case, which I think makes it easier to work through these more uh, contentious issues and recognizing where I think just being honest about the dynamics on our side and being able to, yeah, I think just keep our lines of communication open. I mean, it, again, it sounds so trite, but that's that's what I respect Luke for. Like there's not a lot of there's not a lot of BS or maneuvering. That's what I think makes it work for us. So this sound it sounds like such a functional relationship that the two of you have. I mean, do you think that this type of dynamic 
Does it also translate into actual members working with one another on a day-to-day basis? And is it what we see or what we often see on the outside, which is sort of fighting or um, disagreement? Is it like then, okay, you can then close the door, you know, and two members can then talk to each other like th- the way the two of you talk with each other? Is it is it kind of the same at the member level or or not really? You know, I've had experience working in a, in a, for a personal office and for a committee and now in leadership. And I've seen it play both ways. Uh, you can have a great relationship at a staff level, but if the two members don't get along or don't like each other, it's going to be hard to actually execute and do and do things. But I've seen other times where the the staff relationship is, is, is really good. The members don't know each other, but realize their staff have a good relationship and see an opportunity there where, okay, if I can trust them at a staff level, that's a good indicator that I can, I can trust them at a member level. And that really opens up the opportunity. I mean, one kind of big thing that we did last Congress is is um, CATSA and Russia sanctions, and we were a part on that. And if we went in assuming that you're on the opposite side of a national security issue, you must not care about America, then getting to the next step of, of compromise and what can we agree on is very, very difficult. And I actually think that's not just related to national security bills and national security issues. That's true on all sorts of different issues, healthcare, immigration. So if we just immediately assume, oh, that person must not be a patriot because they're on a different side of the issue, then I think we're being, one, intellectually lazy, and two, I think we're missing an opportunity where we really could get something good done. It takes work to understand the logic of the other side. But I know with Daniel there is logic there, and I just need to – if I'm not understanding, it's probably because I'm not asking the right kind of questions. And so it was, it was really fun to work on Russia sanctions together because we both went in – knowing that U.S. national security is a, a top priority, is the priority for our counterpart. Now, how do we get there to address what we both agree is, is a threat? And it, it was it was hard. It took weeks of negotiation. But we got there, as you well know, uh, being involved in that process probably more than any of us. It but was a very interesting process. It was, and unique in some ways, and that's a whole other story. But I think it's a good example of where everyone is kind of willing to at least hear the other person out, try and understand where they're coming from. You actually can get some pretty big things done. Or ARIA. Or ARIA, Asia, Asia Reassurance Initiative Act. That's right. Um, it was a, a bill that we passed late last Congress and increased into the billions, uh, the amount of money that we give for security partnerships, development initiatives, diplomacy, human rights, democracy to our Asia allies. And it was, it was a significant bill in the sense that it was where the rubber hit the road in terms of Asia strategy. You know, we, we say we want to engage our allies in Asia. What does that really look like? And we were, we went to Shangri- Shangri-La together in dialogue, and that, that was the number one message that we heard from our partners and allies in the region was, okay, you say you're on our, on our side. What does that actually look like? And, and Arya was a, a, another good example of us getting a good on a bill, which there wasn't an immediate agreement on in a way that was actually really good for our national security by the time it got passed. So uh, this reminds me, you know, when I when I left Capitol Hill, I was a staffer in the Senate for five and a half years and kind of came out into the more academic world. Um, one of the things that I heard people sort of talk about out here about Congress was concerns about there being sort of a lack of institutional memory and experience on the part of staff and also sort of a, the pro- there being a problem of sort of a lack of technical expertise on complicated issues that – you know, members are are going to have to legislate on at some point, for example, you know, like artificial intelligence, um, which is kind of a new area. I mean, what I was hearing was sort of struck me as sort of a bit surprising based on sort of my experience up on Capitol Hill. But what, what do you guys think? Do you think those are valid concerns as you, you know, particularly in your, your sort of leadership role and you look around, you know, what, what are your views sort of on that particular sort of concern or criticism of congressional staff in Capitol Hill? I, I self-servingly and strongly disagree with that characterization, no surprise. At any briefing on a sensitive national security issue, be it Venezuela, Pakistan, Russia sanctions, there are people in the room who've been doing it for 20 years plus, starting in the executive branch and moving over to Capitol Hill. There is extraordinary institutional knowledge, particularly on the defense-related issues. So I think that there's no greater frustration than when the Pentagon comes up in briefs. And in fact, that's where there is a lack of institutional memory, where there is a rotation on a two to three-year basis and people are handling an account for the first time. 
even at the four star level and reciting talking points that people in the room have heard for the last 10 years and uh and failing to acknowledge that on the congressional side there's a hell of a lot more institutional memory if i hear another senior officer come in and tell us that we're about to turn the corner in pakistan my head's going to explode so uh, I, I again i think that's one of those examples where in the executive side there's a perception that oh capitol hill they're all political quite to the contrary there's a very serious layer of knowledge expertise and seriousness yeah i don't think i would disagree with any of that i think what i would add to is congress is it's hard to stay here for a while people lose reelections they retire right and so if 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 i'm a staffer looking to stay on board and work on these issues long term by no fault of my own, I may be out of a job. And I don't think you have that same kind of pressure in the executive branch. And so I think that's an important difference. And I think that gets to longevity in some ways. I mean, I've been on the Hill for 11 years and I'm an old hand for many people. And I wish that we had more people here longer term, but I actually don't think that that's the only pressure in terms of a boss losing or retiring. There's also just the issue of, of pay. I think pay is a real one. I've had a number of colleagues who want to raise a family and they just can't afford to do it, work in a congressional job. I've got a family. I'm very thankful that we, we can make it work. But I've seen too many good people leave because they can find a job where it's still in the field, but they can also raise a family. And I don't think we should force staffers to have to make that kind of choice of raise a family or work on the Hill. So I, I, I think there is some credibility to that critique, if you will. And, you know, the ironic thing is Congress has the power of the purse. Um, so I think, I think it's worth a discussion on how do we make it easier for staff to, who, who are good to, to stay, quite honestly. Yeah, I think yeah. that is, is worthy discussion. I know that type of thing definitely factored into my, my own departure from the Hill. Um, not so much the pay issue mm -hmm. um, as much as the type of hours um, that uh, you, you really need to put in and the type of role that I was in uh, and the inflexibility on time. Mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. you know, Capitol Hill is one of those places where, you know, it's still about being president and being, you know, they're being FaceTime and the, the work gets done because people are talking to each other face to face. It's, it doesn't, it's not conducive to telework, a unique place in that respect. Um, so I, I just want to telescope back a little bit up to, you know, there's been tons of, of work in the press and in academic circles about um, sort of a, a resurgence of, you know, realizing the importance of separation of powers, constitution, constitutional checks and balances. Uh, you know, most academics sort of out there, I think, have concluded that the, the presidency itself over multiple presidents, not just this current president, you know, have, the, the presidency has succeeded in garnering sort of outsized power uh, for itself, particularly in the in the foreign policy and national security uh, space. So at the expense of the legislative branch of government, uh, do you agree? Do you agree with this assessment? Do you think it's a problem? What are your, when your sort of broader reflections on separation of powers and checks and balances? Daniel, you want to start? Sure. This is a debate actually that Luke and I have been having, and in fact, we we did a conversation at CFR a number of months ago on it. I I subscribe to that view that there has been a massive outflow of power from. Capitol Hill. And it's it's most pronounced in the war powers context. Uh, I, I think there are any number of examples one can point to today to highlight you know, where Congress's power has been attenuated, no more so than the debate we're having on the wall right now. That said, I'm also mindful of the counter argument that Katza imposing a congressional review requirement in the sanctions context was pretty bold and somewhat unprecedented. That's on, Margaret's fault. Yeah, exactly. Nice job, Mark, because she did an aura too. <laughs> and on, on, on balance, I'm not, notwithstanding your wonderful craft work there, I, I'm not sure that that outweighs this notion of what Luke said, that Congress is for the most part reactionary. And our challenge is where do we find the areas where Congress can play an affirmative role? And I, I, it's funny because Luke and I have been assailed by former staffers. We were at a, a dinner a number of months ago 
where we were assailed on one issue for failing to find a solution on this intractable issue and engage members to stand up and force the executive branch to take action. I would love it if we could do that on something like Syria or any number of nearly impossible foreign policy challenges. I just I think that's tough coming from Capitol Hill, especially when no one on the outside has come up with a decent solution. And if anything, it highlights the extent to which we are utterly in touch and dependent on the intellectual capital that's happening off the hill. Yeah, I mean, one frustration from that dinner that Daniel referenced was when we were getting lambasted, there actually was no solution offered around the table for what we should do. It was just, you're not doing anything, do more. I, I think one of the challenges, which kind of gets again back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of between executive branch and congressional, is when we do something, it's public law. It's very hard to change, right? You can have a new administration policy and change it the next day almost. But when you're trying to address a foreign policy issue, which is dynamic and is going to change certainly over the next few weeks and probably over the next few years, and you're trying to write law to address it, that's a, that's a challenge. That's hard to do. And so I, I just throw that out there in terms of it's not as easy as people may think in terms of passing bills related to foreign policy. The other thing is I, I do think that there is growing consensus, which is interesting for me to see in the media, amongst the public, amongst members of Congress, that the president or the, the office of the president has too much power. And whether we're talking about Obama administration executive overreach or Trump administration executive overreach, I don't think you, you can deny we're, we're certainly hearing more chatter about is there too much power constant, uh, concentrated in the office of the president? I think the challenge there, and we see this amongst Republicans, we see this amongst Democrats, is the president kind of by definition, right, has the bully pulpit. He is the leader of the party. And, and it, as long as we have two parties in our system, you're going to have half of Congress or however much one party makes up of Congress at that time who are going to have to weigh bucking the leader of their party in a rebuke and actually passing a law. And I don't see that, what I think is, is, is a constitutional structure changing anytime soon. So as in, you know, kind of from a congressional perspective, exciting that people are finally talking about, you know, maybe Congress needs to rethink about what kind of laws it passes in, in terms of being more consequential. I also realize the inherent difficulty that that involves when you're talking about the leader of your party. I live that difficulty, so I totally understand what you're talking about. Um, okay, last question, and then I have a comment. So my last question is, you know, I think Americans, there, there's the Congress gets very low sort of approval ratings from Americans. Um, I happen to think that's because they don't really know a whole lot about how Congress works. So just to both of you, you know, what is sort of one thing you'd like Americans to know about Congress that you think they probably don't, don't see or don't understand? Um, it could be a good thing or a bad thing. Terrible cafeteria food. <laughs> we we kind of referenced this earlier. I mean, constituents matter. If if you have a group who is organized at a grassroots level and has a very clear position on a policy and is willing to we say lobbyist is a bad word, but lobby their member, right? In other words, make their opinions known to the member that member is going to take it into consideration. And of course, the more grassroots support you have, the more the, I think the member needs to respond to it. So there's, a, there's an organization issue. There's a, there's a capacity issue there. But I guess push comes to shove is don't be afraid to be part of the political process. First, vote. You have to vote, right? If, if you don't vote, you're losing your voice. I think that's very real. Coming from two people who live in D.C. <laughs> well, <laughs> Maryland, but close, yes. Uh, and then second is, is, is make, your, make your opinions known. Write letters, write emails, hold your members accountable when you disagree with them. Write, write back to them, write follow-up letters, right? Ask why they haven't co-sponsored this bill even though you wrote asking them to do so three weeks ago, right? We have a democratic process which is still, after all these years, responsive to the public. And I think that's a wonderful privilege that we have in our country. Lots of people around the world, and maybe even less and less these days, have that privilege. 
don't give it up. Go out, vote, be part of the political process. Yeah, I, th- I think there's a lack of appreciation on the extent to which serious congressional work happens in districts, not in Washington. And the more that constituents form coalitions to inform members in their home space, Mm -hmm. I think the greater impact it has. I also think there's a lack of understanding of, one, the extent to which there is a cadre of members who are quite serious, understand these issues, and are not just looking to score points or you know, play shirts and skins game. I remember John, I'm reading The Best and the Brightest right now, and President Johnson's critique of the Kennedy group was that he said, God, you know, I think he was quoting Sam Rayburn. He said, you know, I, I just wish that one of these Harvard guys had run for Texas sheriff or something, you know, just had minimum of political experience. Because what I see with our members who have gone through the gauntlet of a campaign and having to be on their feet and answer questions is not that they are as steeped in foreign policy as Luke and me, but that they understand what their constituents are thinking and that they have had a a test. And that's ultimately what the, this political process is about. So I think having a sense of confidence that things are not as dysfunctional, chaotic, or ignorant as people imagine them to be is helpful. And the, the last thing I would flag is all kinds of articles are being made about splits on the Democratic side between progressives and moderates. And no question there are serious splits. I didn't appreciate when I came from the executive branch the extent to which it's not even ideological splits. There's also just fundamental power dynamics within Congress on any given issue. It's House, Senate. It's leadership rank and file. It's choosing between different caucuses. And so this idea of, well, Democrats all stand for this, that almost never happens. Great. Well, we'll leave it at that. And I want to thank you, Daniel and Luke, for coming on the on the Law Park podcast. Um, and I, in particular, I want to thank you because I know that it's pretty rare for congressional staffers to be authorized to sort of speak in a public way like this. Um, but I, I think you'd probably agree with me. I think it's important for for uh, for Americans to know more about the Congress and how it works. So I, I really thank both of you for coming on. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. We're both big fans of lawfare, so (laughs) appreciate it. And hopefully we didn't say anything that's going to get us in trouble. (laughs) I'm sure. I'm sure that's not true. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Thanks this week to Luke Murray and Daniel Silverberg for coming on the show. If you haven't yet, please take a second to share the Lawfare Podcast on social media and give us a five-star rating and review wherever you found us. You can also now purchase Lawfare swag at our online store, www.thelawfarestore.com. The podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our audio engineer this week is Michaela Fogel, and our music is performed by Sophia Jan. As always, thanks for listening. <laughs>